Greetings in the Lord Jesus. He's my friend. I love him with all my heart. And I need him every day. Same with my bride, Kimberly. And same with Luke the Scholar. And with you, those who are within this family, members of the Ecclesia. He is everything to us. And we rely on him for body, soul, and mind. And so each day we seek him and acknowledge our love for him as he does for us. The relationship that I have with him, there's an intimate relationship, but it's not exclusive to me. He wants the same thing for you. And you may have heard that for the last few years, but it is true. I'm, I'm no different than anyone else. Uh, I simply uh, you know, rely on the grace of God and his mercy. And for some reason, he chose to uh, reveal himself in that way, but it's not only for me. It's family time. I am always honored and thankful to be able to join you wherever you're at. If you're watching live or if you're like my truck driver friends or mechanics or others that listen while they work, welcome in our wisdom warriors, our sage warriors, and intercessors throughout the world. We have assemblies that gather. We have great orators that can use just amazing and fancy words. We have great choirs. We have worship leaders. But in this hour, we need those that know how to pray. And many that say, I don't know how to pray, or others that I don't really feel like praying. We, you and I, must have a daily prayer life that we talk with him. Prayer for me is when I say, let's pray. I talk to him the way I talk to you, obviously with the utmost respect uh, to honor him uh, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, as I've told him many times, I really can't identify with a king because I've never you know, been with a king. Uh, the high priest, uh, those offices, both spiritual and administrative with the kingdom, I really can't grasp, but the man, Jesus Christ, uh, who walked Galilee and taught his disciples and so many others, uh, that's who I can relate to in this hour. And so I talk to him that way. This is an early broadcast. I will post it and we'll be with Kimberly tomorrow. and tomorrow night when she is uh, at the hospital uh, undergoing surgery. And normally my broadcast days are on Thursday. Not for sure what Thursday will be. I know that uh, we are praying for the best and that she will be released on Thursday. We thank you for your prayers. We thank you for the special notes. And <laughs> I weep a lot. And someone had said, this is how you are as a family. I don't mention names, but when someone sent, here's some money for you and Luke to get something to eat at the hospital. Just to think of that is, is amazing. Those that support us, I don't have the post office box put up. And as you can see, I, I went from what the scene was last week to this one. We still, after the movers left, they left sofas and beds, my credenza. They, they lost the box to the screws and parts and things. So we're not for sure what's going to happen. But many, many things have hit us at one time. And uh, emergency rooms and all those unexpected costs. But we're thankful. We honor God. We thank God. And we praise him and believe that his hand is upon us. And I say this, and I, as an introvert, 
I have never shared things about my life or my own family, but it's to the point where he wants, he always asked me to be transparent and I am, but to share with you those things of a Bible teacher, of someone that is an intercessor, a prophet, but someone who considers Jesus his best, as he said, male friend, and my best female friend is going to surgery tomorrow. So let's see how we do. No monitor. I have a lot of scripture today, and I'm going to cover a few things. And since I don't know what next week will be, hopefully this will give you more time to review this and maybe go back the second time uh, if you think there's some things in it that are for you. So let's get started. About six weeks ago, maybe two months, at night I had different lessons kind of directed, and he told me what I'd be teaching on. And he's able to change anything at any time, and he did that. He said, the teachings that I'm providing through you are for maturity and growth and a better understanding of some of the mysteries in the Bible, but also the revelation of Jesus Christ, of who he is. And so he stopped about six weeks ago and said, I, I know that my family is, many are in fear. Um, they're anxious about the circumstances around us. And he asked me to start on that. So I'll cover a few of those because I didn't know ahead of time. I, I never know ahead of time the exact sequence. So let's see how we do today. On May the 9th, it was fear and peace through Christ. And so we talked about fear, and I went through detailed teachings on it. It started out as Charles Dickens, The Tale of Two Cities, perhaps best known for his opening lines. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Uh, Bereans, I... <laughs> I love you, and I am so thankful that you check the scriptures and you review them and go over them. Today, there are going to be a lot of scriptures, and I like to post them, but I'll read a lot. It's not my style. I like to talk and look at notes and look at pictures, but keep up with the scriptures and review them. So take good notes, Bereans. Romans 8.15, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. I'm talking to you, men and women that are watching, that are members of the ecclesia. And if you're not, I hope there's a longing in your heart to know him. The spirit of adoption as sons, whom we cry, Abba, Father. Okay. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything. Jim, <laughs> with your wife going through surgery. When things affect me, I absorb it and, and fight and battle. When they impact Kimberly or Luke, it's different. I'm, I'm like the, hopefully the lion that protects his pride, P-R-I-D in lions, not pride as in arrogance. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer, in supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. And it talked about fear. Second Timothy 1 7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Discipline is what it means. Sound mind is discipline. And then I gave you Psalms to look through, Psalms 91, 1 through 16, and it lists out those things. And Romans 8, 31 through 39, where he says that the Apostle Paul is saying not height, nor depth, nor principalities, nor powers, things created, invisible, visible. And that's for you and I. We're in this day. The arena that we warfare in is an unseen realm. And it is a battle over our soul. So you have the fallen carnal nature trying to influence the soul. And you have the Holy Spirit who has regenerated your soul with the spirit at warfare. And so there are, there's that warfare that's inside of the sinful nature. And then that warfare that's outside. 
Then on May the 16th, I, <laughs> I showed you those, those sheep that uh, a lot of wool. We covered baggage. We covered the shearing that the shepherd does for each one of us. Uh, the wool is good and it keeps us warm, but too much, you know, burrs. And if they roll over on their back, they can't turn back over. And the analogy was, what are the things in this world that are sticking to you? What are they that's sticking to me? Uh, you know, will they get caught up in thorns or always trying to get to the greener grass on the other side? They get caught in fences and barbed wire. So that's what the Lord was alluding to in that. And then promotion. I told you that in Psalm 75, promotion does not come. We think it comes from man. And when we are overlooked, we can understand that they just don't like me. They know I'm a Christian or whatever their reasoning is. But true promotion, the, the best promotion that you and I can receive is promotion in the spirit by God to have that authority and level of power and understanding of Jesus Christ. From, Revelation, from Genesis to Revelation, it is all about him and you and I being a part of that. Job 5, 17 through 27, we covered those. And he'll be in famine, which is death, or to be famished, or hunger, war, fighting as in battle, the scourge of the tongue. It says it scourge is lash or whip. Have you been, people say things about you that hurt you? What's that saying? Sticks and stones may hurt my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's not true. Words go deep and they hurt and they're lasting. Approaching ruin, beast, the unclean, uh, evil beast. So let's talk about not only the ravenous type of beast, but those things that may, you know, microscopic in size. And the stones in the field. I don't know where my stuff is. Let me see if I can do this. On May 30th, why do those who are wicked prosper? The Lord wanted me, as he taught me and is teaching all of us, to show that there are great men and women of God, not only in the Bible, but throughout history, that have endured tremendous warfare. Um, it's inexplicable, it's, but it's there. It's a reality. Jeremiah 12, 1 through 2. Righteous are you, Lord, Adonai, when I plead my case with you, yet I speak with you about justice. Is that not prevalent today, justice or the lack of justice? Why do the wicked prosper? So if we look today and we see that there are people around us, either in the work site or anywhere else, that prosper and you know or have a feeling that they are wicked, or if you're at work, you know some of the things they do. Jeremiah asked, why do all the treacherous thrive? And he said, you planted them and they've taken root. We also looked at Habakkuk. <laughs> Surprised I'm able to even pronounce it. Probably wrong, Habakkuk. One, two through four. He lodged his complaint directly to God. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? So do you ever feel like your prayers are not being heard or, an or answered? You say, I pray and pray and there's nothing, Jim. I, I don't see any action, I don't see any nothing. This was a prophet of God called to a nation to prophesy. And he's saying, I cry, and you don't hear me. I cry out about the violence, and you don't deliver us from that. He says, why do you show me inequity? He calls me to hold the whole grievance. And many people say, I want to be a prophet or a prophetess. That's a calling of God. That's not something you choose to do. And if you're called and you are, and he shows you things that this prophet question, why do you have to show me those things? Uh, down in the bowels of the Vatican, years ago, the, the, the lab in Wuhan, all those types of things. And then he shows it and says, I don't want you to talk about it. I just want you to see it. And then slowly he'll let me release some of that. For spoiling and violence are before me, and they that raise up strife and contention. And then Zephaniah, 112, and it shall come to pass that time I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees. I told you lees was their rear end. 
They say in the heart, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. So they're saying even today that God doesn't care. He's, he's, he's doing nothing. Where's, you know, where's his miracles? So they continue in their sin. And part of that teaching was, is God dead? And I had mentioned the words, three words that appeared on the front cover of Time magazine, April 8th, 1966. It shocked Christians across the nation. Is God dead? The reaction was unanimous almost throughout the country. So my question to you was, what reaction would that be today? I don't think it'd be near like it was in 1966. We covered three things, the case against God. Things do not go my way. God is often silent and hidden from me. And third, God allows pain and suffering in my life. And they went through each one of those to refute that, to show that God is there all the time. He's here. <laughs> when these movers left us high and dry, he's here. I rushed Kimberly to the emergency room. He's here. Our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit told Moses as he revealed his glory. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, Exodus 34, 6-7. I have to read this and emphasize it to myself a lot. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and thousands to you. You're going through something that, you know, it seems like, Everything is thrown at you in the kitchen sink all at once or just for months things go on. He loves us. And sometimes it's hard to take hold of that. I gave you an example that I thought that last broadcast, it was storming and thundering outside. And you get soaking wet if you go out there. That is a reality. That's not thinking it was if you go outside you're going to get soaking wet and you could get struck by lightning and i said if you were able to get on a plane and lift off above that the sun is still shining and i look at that as the way god is the lord jesus christ is we are going through quote unquote hell sometimes and we're being buffeted on each side and yet god is still on his throne he always was, he always is, and he always will be. So let me move to another, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. Many people don't even read the Old Testament. I, I was with you for years. I didn't like it. He seemed to be capricious. He seemed to be mean, angry, like an old grandfather that would strike you down. But when I read it by the power of the Holy Spirit, and I was able to see Jesus throughout the Old Testament. And he told me at that time, he said, the New Testament is buried in the Old Testament. And I gave you the scripture that it is honorable for kings to search out a matter. So we have searched it out together as a family. And we see the love and the tenderness of the Lord Jesus Christ in the theophany in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament, prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. So Timothy says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, and you and I, we take it and we break it down in Hebrew, we break it down in Greek, Chaldean, Aramaic, whatever it is, so that we can get the original intent and what the culture was at that time. <laughs> I see. I've met the president before. I say my backyard several times, but before that. And anytime I go to see somebody in that position, I always wore a suit and tie. And when I go to church, I always wear a suit and tie. It's just, if I'm going to show that type of respect to 
those on earth, how much more for me personally? Am I going to show that to my Father through the Lord Jesus Christ? And so I've always had a suit on whenever I go to church and when I started these broadcasts. And till I get to the boxes and <laughs> and other things, I you know I don't have a tie and I just I, Kimberly dresses me the best we can right now. So she doesn't have much to work with, but <laughs> she does the best she can. I've taught on this before, so take note on this. When you are overwhelmed and when wet tears turn to just racking, dry sobbing, and you don't think you can hurt anymore, and yet you do. And after you weep like that, it just hurts sometimes to breathe because it's you've wept so much. And you can feel desperation. I want to let you know that you're not alone, that when you're going through these times, it's not because you're bad. It's not because God has given up on you. It's not because he's punishing you. It's just simply in this life we are facing more and more and more. This is the age. This is the last few hours. And the God, the small g of this world is Lucifer, Hasatan. So look at Job. I'm going to talk about five men real quick. Job, Job 3, 9 through 11. Let the stars of it dawn be dark. Let it hope for light, but have none, nor see the eyelids of the morning. They're poetic, believe me. Verse 10, he's talking about his mother's womb. Because it did not the short shut the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. Verse 11, why did I not die at birth? come out from the womb and expire. If you read the book of Job, you can see that that's one of the themes he has, that he is so exasperated that he, he just wants to die. Now, his wife gave him advice. She came to him and said, why don't you curse God and die? Job didn't curse God, but he did ask him direct questions. And in the end, it was Job that was right with the questions he was asking. It was okay that he could ask those questions, but God never gave him an answer because God is who he is. He is I am. He is anything he needs to be. But you have to remember in that that he wraps you in a mantle of love. It may not feel like it, but it is his word. And in this entire universe, it's his word we're going to count on. Moses. The attitude of the Israelites got so bad that Moses told God the burden was too heavy for him to carry. In utter disgust and exhaustion, he cried out to Jehovah. Been there many times. Numbers 11, 10 through 15. Put your place in some of these, please, so that you can know that you feel that way, you've done that, and yet you, Satan will try to accuse you of being a recluse and you have a secret anger towards God and all those lies he will come up with. Look at the Bible, the scriptures, Numbers 11, 10 through 15. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent, <laughs> but two million people, not including the animals. One and a half to two million people. I did my calculation. I think it's closer to two million. And the anger of the Lord blazed hotly and Moses was displeased. And I love these back and forth. It reminds me of the way I do with my best friend. Verse 11, Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? <laughs> I don't feel that way about you, my family. Uh, I love you through the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's being with you and Kimberly. Uh, with me to, to join you and do what I can to help teach. But there are so many other things. That, verse 12, did I conceive all these people? <laughs> did I give them birth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give their fathers? <laughs> this is when he was blaming the people on God, and God would say, they're your people, and they went back and forth. Verse 13, where am I to get meat for all these people? 
for they weep before me and say, give us meat that we may eat. Verse 14, I am not able to carry all this people alone. See, he felt alone. And this is the person that met with God face to face and his life, his face was so transfigured with the glorification being in the presence of God that he put, had to put a veil over his face. For they weep before me, the burden is too heavy for me. Verse 15, if you would treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight, that I may not see my wretchedness. He was exhausted. And so this is a person who has a face-to-face -face relationship with the Lord. The theophany, again, Jesus Christ. You know, Colossians, all things were created by him, through him, and for him. So it just, it's Jesus Christ. He said, this is what i got to go through. Just kill me now. But Job, Moses, what about Jeremiah? He'd been preaching for 40 years with no noticeable results and had received only persecution and sorrows, weary and broken hearted. The weeping prophet cried out. Look at Jeremiah 20, 14 through 18. Cursed be the day on which I was born, the day when my mother bore me. Let it not be blessed. Verse 15. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father. A son is born to you, making him, my father, very glad. Verse 16. Let that man be like the cities that the Lord overthrew without pity. Let him hear a cry in the morning and an alarm at noon. Because he did not kill me in the womb. So my mother would have been my grave and her womb forever great. Verse 18. Why did I come out from the womb to see toil and sorrow and spend my days in shame? If anyone ever tells you you have the ministry or the prophetic of the Jeremiah, the one prophecy that I believe the prophetess never had seen me in her life and prophesied and said, you have the anointing and call of Elisha. I think maybe sometimes God got that mixed up between Elisha and Jeremiah with all the weeping. Let's look at Jonah 4, 1 through 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. You can't get angry with God. He'll strike you down. He'll get mad. He'll take it out. That's all lies. Those are lies. He is a father. Think of a father. Think of your mothers. Uh, there are yeah, their son and daughter can do the worst things in the world. The mother is always there with him. And when they have a good father, he is there too. But it's amazing the love of a mother. If you love in us, the Lord told me the other night, I said, Lord, I love Kim with all my heart and, and, and everything in me. And I love Luke the same way. And I think I said last week, he said, I know, but I love them more. And I said, you know, if you love them more than I do, and I try to love with all my heart, then I'm good with that. So that was, let's go with Jonah. As he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? He had to go to Nineveh. This is why I made haste to Tarshish. For I knew, and this is why he's mad, and these uh, would eventually, 100 years later, come and invade Israel. So he knew that prophetically. He said, I made, I, I flee the different direction. I knew you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. He's talking about a city of Nineveh that were monsters. They would uh, display their enemies on poles at the city gate. They'd lop off their head and stick them on a pole outside the city. These people were monsters. They did atrocious things to their enemies. And yet he says that you will relent even from them if they repent. Verse three, therefore now, Lord, Please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. <laughs> the Lord said, do you well, do well to be angry? He didn't jump. He didn't shout and angry and all those types of things. His father, your father, my father, Lord Jesus Christ said, 
do you do angry to be with, you know, be angry with me? Are you doing right to be angry with me? Look at Elijah. First Kings 19, three through five. Then he was afraid and he rose and ran for his life and came to Bathsheba, which belongs to Judah and left his servant there. Verse four. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And they lay down and slept under the tree. So we can see these five people, that there are five men in the Bible, these in the Old Testament, they pray, they ask God, look, I talk to you all the time. Uh, I'm your prophet or whatever they would say, do me a favor and kill me. I don't want to live any longer. <laughs> These men were handpicked by God to deliver his people, give prophetic warnings, and display the compassion and power of Jehovah. God did not honor any of the men's request. They had served God and they were tired. You have a unique place in God that only you can fulfill. I'm, I, I believe and I, I'll find that in the broadcast in the future, when we do communion, I will share with you what the scene in the garden was. One of the most, I don't know what you would call it, but I'll talk about it. None of the five men committed suicide because God interceded and ministered to them the way he will minister to you. Whether it's you or a loved one, granddaughter, grandson, spouse that has broken your heart or things that you have done. All of the men completed the work God had assigned to them before they finally perished. When life becomes overwhelming, even the most spiritual and mature in the family of Christ want to give up. The five men continue to live to fulfill God's purpose in their lives. So will you. That's why he had me teach this. That's why he has me going over it again, so that you'll hear the message more than once. And as I said before, when I was with him one night, he said, there were several that said, yeah, that sounds good, but it's for everybody but me. He said, I want you to go back the next time and say, no, I heard you. I heard what you were saying. It's not for everybody but you. It includes you, maybe specifically you. So please take that uh, from the Lord. Foundational truths. I'm going to lay some groundwork, and we'll get to one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Whenever we become overwhelmed and want to give up and die, we need to remind ourselves of God's promises and that he has a purpose for our lives that must be completed before our life here on earth ends. We will either be in the rapture or we will meet him uh, by means of the grave. But there is nothing that is going to happen before the plan and purpose and destiny in your life is fulfilled. And there are many you know, I look and I, I see those that teach and preach and uh, they seem to live in, a, in, in an ivory tower and these things are n never affect them. But that's not true. It's not true at all. Uh, and I sit before you as a family member around your living room or kitchen or doesn't matter where it is, out in the barn and just talk. I want to talk about three things first, and then we'll get to it. These terms are used, and I don't think many people understand them at all. So within this teaching, as you know, is a teaching within a teaching. The maturation process in this life. We've heard the word justification. We've heard the word sanctification and the word glorification. That's great. Yeah, I've heard it mentioned. Can you explain it? Can you back it up? That's your life. That's Luke's life. That's Kimberly's life. That's my life in this journey on earth 
encased in this clay vessel that was corrupt with mirth. Adam and Eve passed down sin through the seed. Romans 4, 13 through 25. This is for the purpose to Abraham and his offspring, not only the Jews, but in faith, the father of faith, it says in Hebrews. So are you spiritual in the body of Christ by faith? Your your offspring from Abraham in faith. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through righteousness of faith. Verse 14. For if it is the adherence of the law, who are to be heirs of faith is null. So if it's Judaism and you follow the Torah and the law, there's no need for faith in Christ. They never live up to it. It is 636, whatever it is, commandments. Faith is null and the promise is void. Verse 15. And this is New Testament looking back and explaining. This is the Apostle Paul. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. Okay. Verse 16. That is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be granted to all his offspring of faith not only to the adherent of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. There it is. Do you have the same faith that Abraham had in God? When he was at Ur of the Chaldees, the father told him to leave. He was a moon worshiper. 75 years old, God told him to leave. Abraham, who was the father of us all, verse 17, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God in whom we believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Verse 18, in hope he believed against hope. Are you? Hope against hope. Oh, and all seems to be lost when you prayed and prayed and days and months and years have gone by. In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. Verse 19, he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, 99, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith, and he gave glory to God. 21, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. I'm covering Abraham for a reason. And this is where it started. Abraham, the man of faith. 23, but the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up from our trespasses and raised up for our justification. Romans 5, 16 through 18, it talks about being justified. Okay? What is justification? It's the Greek 1345. 1345 used 10 times. Justified. A judicial decision. Sentence of God being the favorable judgment by which he acquits man and declares them acceptable to him. Not works, not, you remember he said, when those people approached him, said, Lord, Lord, we did all these things in your name. He said, depart from me, I never knew you. Justified by the blood of Jesus Christ alone. When I was in that garden with him and you have these false teachers out there saying there are many ways to God. If there were many ways to God, Jesus would not have had three times in the garden to say, Lord, if there is any other way, and there wasn't, there was one way to God. And that is through the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. So we are instantly justified when we accept him as Lord. 
we are born again. This old heart is not remodeled, it's not refurbished. He gives us a new heart with the right desires, and he renews the spirit that is within us, the rock that he breathed. He breathed in Adam, and Adam became a living soul, and I taught on that. So what is sanctification? The next step, sanctification is the Greek 38 and strong. It's used 10 times as well. Consecration, purification, the effect of consecration of heart and life. What is that? It's our life's journey. We are justified immediately. Our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. We are eternal and we will spend eternity with him because we have accepted his death, burial, and resurrection. As I said, this life is one of the most popular books ever read was Pilgrim's Progress. And Christian, the main character in it, went through so many things until he finally reached the destiny. That is you, that's Luke, that's my bride and myself. This is a journey. Call it Pilgrim's Progress, call it your name's progress, but we are in a process while we are on earth of becoming more and more and more like Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot do this. I wish there was a switch you could flip and we'd immediately be like Christ. It takes you going through some things. It does take weeping for the night. If you have never gone through anything, never faced adversity, that might be an indication. Sanctification literally means to set apart for special use or purpose. That is to make holy or sacred. Therefore, sanctification refers to the state or process of being set apart. That word holy, that's what holy means, to be set apart, made holy. Not as in righteousness, just set apart. As a vessel full of the Holy Spirit of God. The concept of sanctification is widespread among religions, including Judaism and especially Christianity, quoting from Wikipedia. Justification, sanctification. For what? For glorification. Greek 1391. This is what we're going through. This is what you're going through. Glorification. The glorious condition of blessedness into which it is appointed and promised that true Christians shall enter after their Savior's return from heaven. We'll be with him throughout eternity. Romans 8, 18. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory. That word 1391 which shall be revealed in us. Romans 9, 23. And that he might make known the riches of his glory, 1391, on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. He's talking about you. Talk about your loved ones if they are born again. Look at Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Again, 1391. Just to give you a few scriptures. So it's, that's what the, pro, the whole process of our life is about. Justification, sanctification, so that we can be glorified as he is justified by the blood of the Lamb as members of the body of Christ, the ecclesia, the ecclesia or the ecclesia, our journey of faith is a process of sanctification, becoming more like Christ, so that we may be glorified with Jesus at his coming. Look at 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, 
if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, many temptations. They're hitting you all at once. Verse 7, that the trial of your faith, trial of my faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found under praise and honor and glory, 1391, at the appearing of Jesus Christ. One last, 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, 1391, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit, capital S, of the Lord. See, you don't have to take what I say, just look at the scriptures, and it's confirmed in the scriptures. So the next piece, what happens when you or I find ourselves in a jam or find ourselves in a situation of our own doing? We hear that thing, you got yourself into this mess, now get yourself out. And that's kind of the thought in society is if you're going through something, you probably did something wrong. That's what they said about Jesus in Isaiah 53. They said that, you know, he was going through this because God was punishing him. Well, let me tell you from Scripture, that's not true. You can be living the life that the Lord wants you to live, justified, going through the process of sanctification, and everything in the world come against you. And there are times when we do get ourselves in a jam. And does God say, can't help you. You messed up, get yourself out. I'm talking to some that are listening. They're in a situation of their own doing. And they, they're they crying out for some type of relief. They're crying out for some type of escape. And the evil one is saying, he's not going to help you, sinner. You did this yourself. So I emphasize Abraham. You can see the father of faith. So let's go look at Abraham. Genesis 18, 17 through 19. Please take notes. This is one of the more relevant messages that the Lord wanted to give you in this season. If it's not you and you have a loved one, show them this, quote them this, even if they're not a believer. This may help them to realize the love and the mercies of our Father. Genesis 18, 17 through 19. The Lord said, Shall I keep secret from Abraham, my friend and servant? So it shows you that he is a friend of God. What I am going to do, verse 18, since Abraham is destined to become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. If you are of faith, you're through Abraham. 19. For I have known, chosen, acknowledged him as my own, so that he may teach and command his children and the sons of his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is righteous and just, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has promised him, the Amplified Version. Friend of, uh, of God. And there are people that say, you have a personal relationship with Jesus that few people had. Why do you go through these things? What are you doing? Abraham was the friend of God. And we know that from Hebrews. He went through many things. The final being uh, the sacrifice of his only son that he knew would be the heir, Isaac. So I set the foundation for Abraham, set the foundation of who he is. Genesis 12, 10 through 20. Hang with me today. I'm not going to rush through this. You can pause the tape. You can go back. I don't know what's going to happen next week or this week. Now, there was a famine in the land, so Abra, A-B-R-A-M, 
we know it later, later was changed to Abraham, so I just use that. So Abraham went down to Egypt to soldier, for the famine was severe in the land. God never told him to leave, but he did anyway. Verse 11, when he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarah, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Verse 13, say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you and that my life may be spared for your sake. <laughs> Doesn't really sound like the man of faith and friend of God. Sounds like someone desperate and in fear. And like, if you say it's a sister, what's going to happen to her? You're trying to save your own life. Verse 14. When Abraham entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt with, he, he dealt well with Abraham, gave him all kinds of things because it was, he thought it was her brother. He had sheep and oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants. He, he gave him, he just lavished things on him because he took his quote unquote sister. Verse 17. Did the Lord leave it alone? Say, sorry, Abraham, you got Sarah into this. You need to get her out. That's what the world would tell you. That's what these scientists would probably tell you. Verse 17. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Verse 18. So Pharaoh called Abraham and said, what is this that you have done to me? Why did you tell me that she was your wife? Verse 19. Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her from my wife? Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. Verse 20. And Pharaoh gave me an orders concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife, and he was able to keep everything that Pharaoh had given to him. The so Pharaoh said, thank goodness I didn't touch her and no one else did. She's my wife. You brought all this on me. Take her and get out of the country. So that was with Pharaoh, right? Think of Abraham. Do not think of these men as, oh, that's those guys in the Old Testament. I'm talking to you about today, okay? Abraham and Sarah and Gerar, G-E-R-A-R, Genesis 21 through 7. From there, Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Jeb and lived between Kadesh and Shur. And he journeyed in Gerar. And Abraham said to his wife, and Abraham said of his wife, she's my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said, <laughs> You think God cares about you and will intervene in your situation of your own doing? This isn't the first time. This is the second time. Behold, you are a dead man because the woman whom you have taken, or she is a man's wife. Verse 4. Now, Bimelech had not approached her. So he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother? In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have not done this. Here's <laughs> the king of Gerar pleading with God because he said, you're dead. And it was I who kept her. He said, God said, I kept, I kept her from you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Verse 7. Now then return the man's wife for he is a prophet so that he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. <laughs> God said, there's a death warrant out on your family. So he quickly restored her back to Abraham. So this is the second time this great man of faith got himself into a jam, and our father did not leave him to that. Well, I say every time there are consequences in this life. When you sow, you will reap. 
if you've committed a crime and you have uh, been sentenced, more than likely you're going to go to jail or prison. Or if you've done some other thing, if you uh, falsified some records or you did something and your employer finds out about it, it doesn't mean that you cannot call to God. So let's look at the next. Isaac and Rebekah in Gerar. Isaac, Genesis 26, 6 through 11. So Isaac, the son of Abraham, settled in Gerar. When the men of the palace asked about his wife, he said, she's my sister. For he feared to say my wife, thinking lest the men of the palace should kill me because of Rebekah. Like father, like son. Because she was an attractive in appearance. She was an attractive a lady. Verse 8. When he had been there a long time, not just a short period, when he had been there a long time, can you imagine the agony now that he lied again? And so this was a longer period of time. Bimlech, king of the Philistines, looked out of a window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. Verse 9. So Bimlech called Isaac and said, Behold, she is your wife. How then could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, because I thought lest I die because of her. Bilmink said, what is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. Verse 11. So Bilmink warned all the people saying, whoever touches this man or his wife, you're dead. Dead man, dead person walking. So here, Abimelech twice, like, what is it with his family? They got beautiful wives. They call sisters, and I take them in, and the next thing, I have God knocking on my door telling me I'm dead. So maybe he learned his lesson. I gave those so you could understand just a few that there are times we get ourselves in situations, and we think there is no hope. We think that God would give up on us because we did something wrong. It's not to say go out and sin and God to get you out of the jam. That's not what I am telling you. I'm telling you those that just get caught up in something and the consequences that they feel. And, and certainly the accuser, Hasatan, will come and say, he's not going to help you. you. You know, you disobey all those types of lies. He'll come. So keep that. Okay. What about circumstances beyond our control? One of my favorite stories. Now listen to this, because there is an analogy there. Bereans see it as David, understanding that David, what he had done through through um, Bathsheba. But let's look at this story and see it for what it is. <laughs> Here we go. Mephibosheth, okay? Mephibosheth is the... Hebrew 4648, Mephibosheth, exterminating the idol to cleave or dash in pieces and the dispeller of shame. That's what his name means. All of that. Mephibosheth, the speller of shame. Okay. Let's follow a journey of Mephibosheth. Second Samuel 4 4. Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And as she fled in her haste, she fell and he became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Lame is the Hebrew 52:23 maimed. Okay. So this prince of the king in fleeing his nurse fell down dropped him and he was crippled for the rest of his life adam sinned crippled us for the rest of our life until jesus delivered us right sin as one man brought sin into the world so we were born crippled actually in sin Second Samuel 9, 1 through 4. And David said, Is there any yet that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Jonathan being Saul's son, he loved David. They, he had favor. And so they cut a covenant with each other. Those covenants that usually slice 
made a cut somewhere on their arm, and then they would blend in their blood and be a covenant. And Jonathan asked him, because Jonathan knew that he would not be the king, but that David would end up being the king. And so he asked, David, would you please take care of my family? And David honored the covenant. So he's walking around the palace one day, and maybe he sees that scar and is reminded of the covenant he had with Jonathan. Is there any of the house of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Verse 2. And there was a house of Saul, a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I'm, Yeah, I'm your servant, Lord. Verse 3, and the king said, is there any yet of the house of Saul that I may show kindness, the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan have yet a son, which is lame on his feet. Everyone know. Verse 4, and the king said unto him, where is he? Because, you know, kings in those days, they searched out surviving family members of an opposing king and killed them all, just the way it was. The king said, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, behold, he is in the house of Mekar, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar, L-O-D-E-B-A-R. Okay. So this prince, born in the king's house, was maimed, lame on his feet, and when they fled and hid, he went to a place called Lodabar. Lodabar is used three times. The Hebrew is 38.10. It's not a pasture. It's a wilderness. It's also a wilderness of no word or communication. Silence. It was considered a ghetto town in biblical times and believed to be the same district as Deber in the tribe of Gad. Joshua 13, 26. So he fled to the wilderness, a dry place with no word. Are you in the world filled with sin? No word, no hope. Are you in a dry place in your walk with the Lord? Do you feel like you're going to load a bar? I felt it many times. And when the Lord revealed this particular story to me, brought it to life and I understood it and it became one of my favorites. This prince, born a prince, not of his own doing, but was lame, had to flee to the wilderness. Mephibosheth awakened to another nightmare. His pulse pounding, the taste of fear felt rancid in his mouth. If only he could forget the screams of men women and children as they rushed to escape the palace. If only he could erase the cry when he was torn from his mother's arms when she cried out. When the messenger pronounced the fatal words, I am sorry King Saul and your husband Jonathan have both died in battle. So he was the son of Jonathan. Saul would have been his grandfather. So when he was taken from the arms by the nurse to flee, she had to face the consequences. But he remembered them as clearly as the moment when he was hustled from the safety of their nurse's arms down a flight of stone stairs as they raced towards safety. The pain that shattered Mephibosheth's legs at the tender age of five equaled the distress in his heart. He then disappeared into the safety of a remote town, Lodabar. For a five-year-old, I guess she was holding him in her arms. The nurse just grabbed him up and was trying to run rather, you know, not just a baby, but a five-year-old. She tripped down the stairs and fell. Adam fell. And we, all mankind, bore the consequences of that. Jesus was born, not of the seed of men, but of God. So different with him. He disappeared to the remote town of Lodabar. A benefactor in Lodabar. 
Once a palace prince, Jonathan, son of Mephibosheth, lived in obscurity under the watchful care of a generous benefactor named Makar, M-A-C-H-R, son of Emil, mentioned twice in scripture. Makar was a man of means. Not only did he support Mephibosheth, later when David escaped from his son Absalom, Makar provided the king and his soldiers with bountiful food and supplies. 2 Samuel 17, 28. Makar, Hebrew 4353. His name means sold. <laughs> How do you like that name? A hey, sold. A powerful chief of one of the Transjordan tribes who rendered essential service to Saul and to David. Emil, his father, was a Levite at the tabernacle. Many commentators believe he was Bathsheba's father. As a result, Makar likely held both economic and religious sway in the small village of Lodabar. Whether out of respect for Makar or because of his ability to obtain desired goods, the town's residents remained quiet about the boy's presence. As a result, Mephibosheth grew up in relative anonymity, even though some might have thought he presented a threat to the new king. They were always uh, dispatched because they could, uh, from the old family, raise up and try and uh, overthrow or, or do a coup against the king. They were always uh, killed. And yet this one survived of Saul, and it was a covenant and a benefactor of a child that grew up in Lodabar, the wilderness, with no word, no communication. Dependent upon a car and unable to provide for himself, Mephibosheth lived as an impoverished orphan. Even the name of the town in which he sought shelter reflected the tragic circumstances. What does the name Lodabar mean? As I had said, no pasture, more literally. If we break the word down into its singular parts, lo means no, and debar means word or thing. There was no word or thing. The settlement was so devalued that people called it nothing, the town, the ghetto town. And this one who was the wealthiest in it took Mephibosheth and raised him and fed him. And it also served not only uh, Saul, but when David fled. Mephibosheth, Jonathan's beloved son, became a man without a place to call his own. He lived on the edge of the wilderness in parched land, an unreachable land, a hopeless land, a town in the middle of nowhere, with nothing to offer and fearful that the king would one day find out where he lived, and kill him. In a wilderness, we were. We had no way out. King David, perhaps prompted during a walk through the gardens or while journaling, writing about Jonathan, David remembered a covenant he once made with his best friend. Through Ziba, Saul's servant, David learned that Mephibosheth was alive and determined he must fulfill his promise. See, there are things going on behind the scenes that you're not aware of. And you may be fearful of the worst and could be the best is turning out. I'm not only talking to you, I'm talking to myself today. Imagine the fear. Mephibosheth experienced when David's horsemen arrived to escort him to the palace. When they heard those chariots coming from miles away, thundering towards him, and the watchmen cried out, It's the chariots of King David. You know, Mephibosheth thought, This is the end. It's it. I'm done. He finally found me, and all those years, the, the anger that he had against David and thought David was this monster that destroyed and killed his family and was just a tyrant. All the things that he had built up in his mind when he was in the wilderness. And he heard the thundering and he knew the chariots and they cried out, it's King David's 
royal palace guard, sequestered in a far-off village, Mephibosheth had hoped his day of discovery would never come. But the man who sat on the throne now requested an audience with him. Probably a death sentence is what he thought. Would he too die? Shuffling into position, Mephibosheth knelt before the king. He could not have known David's words to Zebo. Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's loving kindness? Can you see Mephibosheth trembling as he lays before the king? His body quakes and he bows as low as his uncooperative legs would allow. Second Samuel 9, 8. And he bowed himself and said, what is thy servant that thou should look upon such a dead dog as I am? Dog is the Hebrew 3611 means in excessive humility. Dead, who am I that you would call me out of some ghetto village to bring me to your palace? I think, why didn't you just kill me there? Why did you have to bring me here? When the king speaks, Mephibosheth peers from beneath his eyelashes. His eyes widen when David smiles and offers a hand. This goes against everything in his gut. Are you out in the world and thinking that God is mean? Angry at you? Wanting to punish you? Thinks you're nothing? Thinks you're worthless? When someone tells you the good news, you can't believe it because, you know, God's mean, vindictive. He does, he just destroys people. See, that's what the lies of the devil will tell you. And this is what Mephibosheth had thought all his life. And the day of reckoning came. And when he's laying there, after he called himself a dead dog, humiliated, thinking this is it. His eyes could not believe what he saw. David, the king that he hated his entire life, smiles and offers him a hand. With all that he had heard about King David and the truth about his grandfather Saul, I'm sure Mephibosheth struggles to understand the kindness of the king. Do you understand or puzzle sometimes at the kindness of the Lord Jesus Christ? If you don't know him, he does extend a hand to, to you. He doesn't condemn you. He offers you salvation. He offers you eternal life with him. If you already know him and you're going through very difficult times, his hand is extended to you to reach out, to smile, and to say, I'm here for you, with you. God is the king. Second Samuel 9, 7. And David said unto him, David said unto you, the Lord Jesus Christ says to you, fear not. For I will surely show the kindness for Jonathan, thy father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and that you shall eat at my table continually. Because of Jesus, the sacrifice, the father says, come. Psalms 23 says, I have set a table before your enemies, a banquet table. Come and dine with me. So I invite you to come and sit at the king's table and eat with him and dine with him and fellowship with him. David's action reflect Hest, H-E-S-E-D, Hebrew 2617, often translated as Loving kindness, goodness, kindness, faithfulness in scripture. Hest also infers mercy and several other key ideas. In Genesis, Hest indicates an exceptional favor from God. In Exodus, it is used by God to describe his character. 
That was Exodus 34, 6 through 7. When Moses said, if I have found favor, show me your glory. And this is what the God of the all creation said about himself. Love and kindness, tender mercies. David shared Hess by upholding the promise to a beloved companion and extending unexpected favor to someone he might have chosen to dispatch. David spoke gently to Mephibosheth, restored his family's land, and gave Mephibosheth and his little boy, his son, an invitation to dine at the king's table every day. That invitation is extended to you. If you don't know him, there was a covenant cut between Jesus and the Father. And that covenant said, if you come to Jesus, you have eternal life with him, and you go and sit at the king's table. Mephibosheth and his son Micah, now wealthy recipients of David's kindness, enjoyed the company of the king and his family. Not only that, but Ziba and his sons and servants were assigned to serve Mephibosheth and to form his fields. He said, everything that you lost, I'm restoring. Everything that the king had and his son, Jonathan, all the lands, all the fields, all the livestock, it's yours. As a result, Mephibosheth gained Ziba's jealous attention. Yes, it is. It plays out later. Years later, when Absalom revolted against David, Ziba seized an opportunity to gain the king's favor. I'm telling you the rest of the story. He convinced David that Mephibosheth planned to usurp power. And the angry monarch responded by giving Ziba half of Mephibosheth's property. I don't think David was convinced, but in anger. 2 Samuel 19, 24. Though this happened, reveals that while David was in exile, Mephibosheth spiraled into depression, refusing to care for his personal needs. He grieved for the king. Not because of what had happened to him. He grieved because of the king. It will be shown later. When David finally returned, Mephibosheth expressed his love and appreciation, even declaring that Ziba can have all the property. Because you gave your servant a place among those who eat at your table. Second Samuel 9, 13. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table. And oh, by the way, he was lame on his feet. Some years later, scripture reports that David spared Mephibosheth, 2 Samuel 21, 7, when the Gibeonites exacted revenge on Saul's family. Three points. The story David and Mephibosheth share offers a picture of God's redemptive love. We, the spiritually impoverished sinners, and the outcast or refused entrance into the heavenly kingdom. But like David, the Lord seeks a relationship with those who did not know him. You, your loved ones, and me, Luke and Kimberly. Through a covenant with an advocate, Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, we can feast at the great banquet. Yes, we are. And we'll have robes of righteousness. When we accept the invitation with humility, our King forgives us of our past and any future sins. When I tell you that God chose Abram and he knew what Abraham would do ahead of time because he knows the end from the beginning and that he would lie about his sister twice and so would his son, God still chose him. He knew what he would do. He knew that he would sin. He knew that he would lie. What about you? What about me? When we mess up, I think, boy, he, he, he knows everything you are, you are ever going to do. He knows every word you're ever going to speak. And yet he called you into his family anyway. It's not something you do today that surprises him or shocks him or angers him. And I didn't expect that. He knows everything you're going to do. He knows everything I'm going to do. And guess what? He still chooses you. Confirms the covenant, seals you with the Holy Spirit. 
But where were we when Jesus Christ found us? We were living in Lodabar, a parched, dried up place. Just like David sought out Mephibosheth, Jesus Christ sought us out. We didn't seek him. He sought us out. He first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. No man can come to the Father into this great covenant unless the Spirit draws him. The second, although multiple scriptures confirm God's compassion for the orphan and those living with disabilities, Mephibosheth's narrative beautifully relates his abundant love for those who struggle and provides a template for believers as we honor others unlike ourselves. Esteem others more highly than yourself. So when you see someone and you think of what has been done in your life, I hope for me and for you and all of us, extend mercy. Remember what's been done for you. Been through so much. People say you live in a glass house. I have no place to judge anyone. I have a place to extend mercy and grace and have a gift of intercession to pray for. You say, well, they did you wrong. They... So what? Here I am today. Yes, there are people that do all types of things. That's between them and God, not me. Ignorance of suffering is no excuse. If you see someone suffering, if you see them in need, you see them hurting, you should step up. Those are the rewards that God does. When you do it privately, when you help someone in need, when you help someone that has no other way to turn, do it privately so that you may be rewarded by your father openly. And I may talk about prayer, but not like the Pharisees did to seek attention. That is their reward. You see someone hurting or in need, try to, and we, that's anonymously help. Church needed a freezer, anonymously. Church needed a laptop, anonymously. Like when I had a good job and income. And give us, I don't want anyone to know where it came from. And the same thing with those that you see suffering. Help them. You'd be surprised how many doors open for you and how many blessings you didn't count on will come. As God's ambassadors, we, you and I, are to actively pursue ways in which we can love and serve people both inside and outside the body of Christ. They shall know us by our love. The third one, we were surviving a wilderness season reminiscent of Lodabar. We can trust God and move on our behalf. The days of no pasture were in, and he will guide us to new places, fresh and abundant with his presence. Maybe that was to me. But if it's for you, then take it. This is the lesson. I said, all those others are good. I want to teach them. Right now, this is the time for my family. And as I told you before, the prophet usually has to go through the stuff first. And I think it's all, then I realize he says, it's not about you. Yeah, you're going through it. And I'm not pulling any punches. But this is to show you that it's about my family. Two others. But in that category, think of Ruth and Naomi. The story of Ruth and Naomi is beautiful. Esther and the Persian king. Peter in the dungeon, angel set him free. When God moves on your behalf of things not your own doing. Esther, she didn't want to be hostage. She didn't want to be taken and Three years of training with this king. Sometimes we go through things for the glory of God. John 9, 1 through 3. This is what they said about Jesus, and this is what they say about you. This is what they say about me. John 9, 1 through 3. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, those that are religious, those that like to 
saying, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind? If you're going through some things, it must be something you've done. You must have some sin, some hidden sin. Uh, Satan will provide you a list. And that list is null and void. Testah, that's testah. When it's on the cross, it is finished. That word means in the Greek, paid in full. He said that word, it is finished. Testah is a word they use for invoices, paid in full. <laughs> Emergency room. And I had no idea. Kimberly hadn't been to a hospital since the birth of Luke. And you go a night in the hospital, or she didn't even stay that night, $10,000. Are they accusing you that you're going through a lot of things, that it's you? You've sinned, you've got some hidden sin. And they tell you to go back 20 years and see what you did, some oath. Verse 3, Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but the works of God should be made manifest in him. Sometimes it's nothing of our own doing. It is an opportunity for God to show up and I tell him, would you show up and show off to show that he is God? Last week was, if God is with us, where are his miracles? And I said, Father, it's time that you can show up with your miracles. One last one, Gentile woman for the ladies. My bride. Luke 8, 43 through 48. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all of her living, all of her funds, upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. She depleted everything she had trying to be healed. Verse 44, came behind him, Jesus, touched the border of his garment, his tallit, and immediately her issue of blood was stopped. Or in the kingdom, staunched, it stopped. Verse 45, and Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, my, my boy Peter, and Peter said that they were with him and the other disciples, Master, the multitude throng, uh, they impressed thee, and thou sayest who touched me, saying, my oh, goodness, Lord, you're surrounded by people, everybody's touching you. <laughs> Verse 46, and Jesus says, somebody had touched me, for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. Verse 47, and when the woman saw that she was not here, she came trembling, falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. Verse 48, and he said unto her daughter, hey, some grouch, some angry, some response that you would expect of some of these religious leaders. He said to her daughter, kindly, be of good comfort. Thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace. Well, Jesus didn't say she broke about every rule in the Torah. So let's look at that and then close. The story of this woman takes place within a larger story. Jesus is on his way to a synagogue leader's house to heal his dying daughter. Actually, he raised her from the dead. Mark 5, 21 through 24. When an unnamed woman causes an interruption to his progress. <laughs> Have you ever interrupted the Lord's day? Have you ever cried out? I do. <laughs> He's with us all the time, every day, each day. What we know about this woman is first, she has a bleeding condition. And the issue had continued for 12 years. That's a long time. Have you prayed for years and years and years? I'm still praying for the two girls with Lyme disease. I'm praying for, there are so many things that are still on my list of people that have written to me over the years. I'm still praying for you. I have not forgot you. When I finish my prayer time and I'm with the Lord, he brings people, different families to my memory, and I pray for them each time. Sometimes he'll tell me specifics. Other time he just says, pray for them, and I do. 12 years. I 
can we pray for you because we love you because the Lord Jesus Christ values you and you're special to him. And for some reason, he has given us the ministry and the trust of the family to write into us with your most sensitive issues. Second, she has spent all her money on treatments from many doctors and nothing had helped. In fact, the blood issue had only grown worse. We also know that Jewish law declared her to be ceremonially unclean due to her bleeding issue. So she was unclean. Leviticus 15, 25 through 27. This meant that she would not have been permitted to enter the temple for Jewish religious ceremonies. According to the law, anything or anyone she touched became unclean as well. They were defiled. The fact that she was in a crowd pressing around Jesus meant that each person who bumped into her would have become unclean or defiled, including the rabbi, Jesus. But after 12 years of suffering, she was obviously desperate for a miracle. I know I'm desperate for a miracle. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, put your name, because you thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Mark 5, 27 through 28. As soon as the woman touches Jesus, her bleeding stops, and she knows that she has been healed. In an instant, Jesus does what no doctor in 12 years had been able to do. I'm praying that the surgeon's hands be guided tomorrow, and that the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ would be in the operating. This proves the power of Christ, of course, but it also illustrates an important point about Jesus and the law. In Leviticus 15, 31, God says, you must keep the Israelites separate from things that make them unclean so they will not die in their uncleanness for defiling my dwelling place, which is among them. Because Kimberly is not healed and we have prayed and prayed and prayed. Does that change my view on healing? Absolutely not. My friend, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is a healer. Faith in him. Trust in him. Not for Kimberly this time, but we have had many miracles in the past, and I have seen many. Not those phony miracles, all the true miracles of healing. Uh, times where I've had my, I could see in the spirit, the hands on fire and touching it, completely healed. It wasn't me, it's the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament temple was where God dwelt among the Israelites. But in the New Testament now, God dwelt among men in the person of Jesus Christ, men and women, you and me. He dwells in us. Through Jesus, the penalties of the law are reversed, and the contamination of this world has no effect on Christ. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The woman did not make Jesus unclean, he made her clean. <laughs> That's my Jesus. <laughs> That's your Jesus. Jesus immediately responds to the woman who touched his clothing and was healed. People were pushing and pressing into him from all over. Yet he stops, turns, and asks, Who touched my clothes? Mark 5.30. The dot disciples were incredulous. But Jesus knew that healing power had gone out of him. We cannot steal a miracle from God. They're free. After the woman comes forward and explains herself, Jesus clears up any misconception about her healing, saying, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. Mark 5.34 God is moved to action by our faith. His compassion and mercies never end. They are new every morning. Even when he is in the middle of doing something else. Jesus could have healed the woman, kept on walking to his original destination. 
only he and the woman would have known what had taken place. But he did not do that. Jesus stopped what he was doing and acknowledged the result of the woman's faith, her complete and instantaneous healing. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. This world will eat us alive. The carnal is getting degradation, abominations, injustice, worse by the day. But we're not consumed. Write this scripture down. Chapter 3, 22 and 23. It is the Lord's mercies, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are not consumed. Karen, that Billy, that Mark, that Gail, Brenda, Kevin, you're not consumed. Because his compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. That's my message for today. I'll post it tonight. As, I'll, as I said, I'll be with Kimberly tomorrow, tomorrow night and hopefully get her out Thursday. And she'll probably be on bed rest for quite a while. But even now, with some of the things they've done to her and the pain she's in, she's still writing those letters to donors. I said, baby, I, I've told them and I've explained to them that you might not be able to do that right now. And I said, She loves you, and we love you. We thank you for your donations and support that we receive from you. We don't do this for that. We do it because I know that the Lord Jesus Christ loves you with all his heart. And for some reason, he chose me to be the one to talk to you and to speak to you and to carry his message. And my bride... Man, I said, baby, what are you doing? Sitting at the table writing. And she doesn't have her wax and seal and all. We don't know where that is. Writing to get a note to those who have given. Writing a note to those who have asked for prayer. And I said, baby, you're going to have to rest. They sit anywhere from four to six weeks. And I'll tell them that when they give, we're humbled and we're thankful, but you you got to rest, so we'll see how that works. I know how she is. Thank you for allowing this time. I hope and pray this message that he wanted to give about fear and shearing some of the baggage off of us so we can be promoted in this hour. Promoted? Many of you are going to receive the higher and uh, uh, anointing for intercession not promising pots of gold and silver and bubble, all that. We need intercessors in this hour. And the way he is, not abundantly, but super abundantly above all that we could ask or think. So not only will he give a higher level of anointing for intercession for this nation and for your family and for yourself, but knowing the Lord, he'll also bless you in many other ways. Thank you. We'll continue to pray for your peace. We'll continue to pray for your safety. And the Lord Jesus Christ bless you. Until I see you the next broadcast, I love being with you.